my name is Cesar Pereira. I'm the chair of the Chartered Institute uh, of Arbitrators Brazil branch. And together with my uh, colleague here, Daniel Nogueira, who is also on the board of directors of the Brazilian branch of CIR, uh, we are very proud to host this uh, webinar uh, on uh, some very crucial and uh, important issues regarding contract law in uh, Latin America. We are very happy to have here uh, with us uh, today uh, an exceptional lineup of scholars uh, in uh, private law, uh, beginning with, with Professor Ingeborg Schwenzer, uh, known certainly to uh, all of you um, in, this, uh, in, in our audience. Uh, Professor Schwenzer is, uh, is uh, 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 a Professor Emerita uh, from the University of Basel in private law and uh, author of, uh, and, of, of and, and editor of uh, the most uh, renowned commentary on the CISG, uh, which is, as you all know, part of the national law of uh, many Latin American countries. Uh, we also have uh, with us Professor Edgardo Munoz uh, from uh, uh, Universidad Panamericana Guadalajara, um, Professor uh, Rodrigo Momberg uh, from uh, the uh, Catholic University of Valparaíso in Chile, and Professor Renata Steiner uh, from the University of McKenzie uh, in, in Sao Paulo, Brazil. Uh, so uh, with that group, uh, we will uh, certainly be able uh, to discuss in depth uh, some um, uh, absolutely unavoidable uh, issues uh, that we are we, we must face now uh, with regard to co contract law in Latin America. As you, as, well, I, I don't I don't even need to say that, but as you all know, we are facing uh, today. Uh, 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 a context in the economy and uh, in, in contract uh, relationships and um, in well in the world in all kinds of aspects uh, that is unprecedented is uh, absolutely uh, um, uh, unpredictable and um, and that creates all uh, kinds of, of uh, discussions uh, with regard to how. Uh, to deal with um, uh, contracts, uh, what type and what extent uh, of uh, interference, if any, uh, should a judge or an, arbit an arbitrator uh, be allowed in this context, uh, whether uh, we do have uh, sufficient laws to deal with these issues or whether we need uh, our national congresses uh, to enact specific legislation. Uh, we, these are all uh, issues that uh, we will be um, very privileged uh, to be able to discuss with our speakers today. Uh, unless uh, Daniel uh, has any other remarks at this stage, uh, I, I will um, again thanking our speakers and thanking our audience uh, for for this uh, for, for for being here and um, attending uh, this discussion, I will uh, without any without taking any more time from our speakers, I will turn to Professor Ingeborg Schwenzer uh, for uh, her presentation. Uh, Ingeborg, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Cesar. First of all, I wanted to thank you very much for organizing. Uh, this uh, wonderful virtual event. Welcome all of you. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, first of all, Cesar, could you please uh, activate my screen? It's still deactivated. Okay. So um, again, welcome everybody. Sorry for the short delay. Uh, I called my presentation today CISG and PICC Inidra Principles in COVID-19 Times. So first what I'm going to talk about 
Uh, after a very short introduction, I'll discuss the possible legal basis under the CISG and under the unit drug principles. And then we ask ourselves the question whether COVID-19 is a force majeure event or whether it might lead to hardship in international contracts. And then briefly, I will touch upon the possible remedies and finally conclude. Uh, Cesar Pereira already mentioned it, um, COVID-19 uh, has hit global trade at an unprecedented speed and, um, and scale. Uh, manufacturer factories have been shut down. We had a breakdown of supply chains, increase in costs, uh, and breakdown for market for buyers. So this all leads us to the question, how can we use the existing international sets of rules to deal with all of these cases? So let me turn to the possible legal basis. Like with any uh, contractual problems, the, the first question is, did the parties provide in their contract for a force majeure or hardship clause? Parties are advised to do so beforehand, and they might have done by inserting an ICC force majeure or hardship clause. Uh, up to now, we had the force majeure and hardship clauses of 2003, and these have been revised and we now have new force majeure and hardship clauses of 2020, especially the hardship clause has been slightly amended uh, in view of the international developments, especially as regards the remedies for hardship. So if the parties have not provided in their contract for any such clause, in an international contract, we may either uh, rely on the CISG or on the INUDRA principles. The CISG, as you uh, know, the United Nations Convention on Contracts for the International Sale of Goods, that has been in force in Brazil for a couple of years now, and that is in force in uh, altogether 93 countries in the world, thus covering more than 80% of international trade, covers the sales contract. So only if we do have a sales contract, the CISG comes into play. And um, the core provision is Article 11A of the CISG. It, uh, the CISG applies if both parties' places of business are in CISG member states. For, uh, for commercial parties from Brazil, this means that most of Brazil's export and import trade potentially is covered by the CISG if the parties have not excluded the CISG. Uh, the CISG uh, contains Article 79, and 79 CISG clearly covers force majeure. And as regards now the prevailing opinion in, um, in case law, as well as in scholarly writing, is that the same provision, Article 79 CISG, also covers cases of hardship. If we do not have a, a sales contract governed by the CISG, we might apply the UNIDRA principles on international commercial contracts, PICC principles on international commercial contracts. They uh, govern any contract, not just contracts for the sale of goods, and they apply not like uh, the, the CISG, um, by its own, but only if the parties have chosen the UNIDRA principles or if they have chosen the Lex Mercatoria to govern their contract. The UNIDRA principles contain different principles. They do have a force majeure provision in Article 7.1.7, .7, but Additionally, they also have provisions on hardship 
and the core provision is 6.2.2 of the UNIDRA principles. Let's briefly turn uh, to the relevant statutory provisions. Article 79 CISG, a party is not liable for failure to perform any of his obligations if he proves that the failure was due to an impediment beyond his control and that he could not reasonably be expected to have taken the impediment into account at the time of the conclusion of the contract or to have avoided or overcome it or its consequences. So under Article 79, um, for an exemption of the seller or of the buyer, uh, uh, we need three prerequisites. We have an impediment beyond the control of the party. And this impediment was not foreseeable at the time of the conclusion of the contract and not avoidable uh, when it came into being. So those are the three prerequisites under Article 79. More or less, we have the same prerequisites under the UNIDRA principles, impediment beyond its control, um, not foreseeable and not avoidable. As I already mentioned, Article 79 of the CISG also applies to cases of hardship whereas the NIDRA principles do have a separate provision on hardship. And there we can find there is hardship where the occurrence of events fundamentally alters the equilibrium of the contract. So that is the first prerequisite, fundamental altering of the equilibrium of the contract uh, and these uh, must be due to events that occur or become known after the conclusion of the contract. Again, like in Article 79 of the CISG, the events could not reasonably have been taken into account by the disadvantaged party at the time of the conclusion of the contract, were not foreseeable, with other words, the events are beyond the control of the disadvantaged party and the risk of the events was not assumed by the disadvantaged party. So this is the legal basis from which to start. Uh, we start now to ask ourselves what has happened during uh, the COVID-19 uh, crisis. Can the COVID-19 crisis uh, be a force majeure our hardship and what are the consequences for the, the parties, for the contracts affected by this worldwide crisis. First of all, a pandemia as such is usually uh, regarded as being a force majeure event. Uh, it is provided for in the uh, in the force majeure clauses by the ICC, epidemics and pandemias are mentioned there explicitly. The question is, um, does this amount to an impediment hindering performance? And when discussing this question, we must have a look at the different situations, at the different problems that COVID-19 has created. There may be the shutdown of a factory, of a manufacturer, who at the same time is the seller of the goods. This is a clear-cut force majeure event. The seller is not able to manufacture the, the goods and thus to deliver the goods. And this is also clearly an impediment beyond the control of the seller in this case. The same as uh, applies to cases of export prohibition, where the seller is prohibited from exporting uh, some, some goods to another destination, as has been the case, especially with uh, protective, uh, protective tools, 
Um, so this is also clearly a force majeure event and will lead to an application of Article 79 of the CISG. There are more and more difficult problems with the failure in the supply chain because under Article 79 of the CISG, a failure in the supply chain is not an impediment beyond the control of the seller, except where the parties have explicitly foreseen uh, the, the relevant person in the as a supplier. The same applies to increase of costs. Increase of costs are certainly not an impediment that hinders performance of the contract, but increase of costs, as we have seen now during the COVID-19 crisis, tremendous increase of costs, not only in producing, uh, in the manufacture of products, because the manufacturer has to adhere to, to certain security standards, but also increase of transportation costs um, that, that hardly or that, that were never foreseen. Uh, these these uh, uh, problems might give rise to a discussion of hardship, but they are certainly not a force majeure event because they do not hinder performance in itself. They make performance much more onerous for the, for the, uh, for the party. Likewise, a breakdown of the buyer's market, as we have also experienced it, in, uh, in these times does not release the buyer from accepting the goods, from taking delivery of the goods and from paying the purchase price in itself. It's not an impediment hindering performance by the buyer, but rather it might amount to hardship. And we will have to discuss whether this was extremely onerous for the, for the party um, affected by this. Let me briefly turn to the, the, to the remedies because as Cesar Pereira mentioned in the beginning, that's a, a very important question. Do we need additional laws, additional rules uh, for these cases? So let's have a look at the remedies first. Uh, regarding force majeure. If we look at Article 79 of the CISG, we find uh, the consequence of a force majeure event, event or any impediment beyond the control of the aggrieved party is exemption. Exemption means exemption from paying damages. There is still a bridge We lost Professor Schrenzer. I think so. Well, I cannot, you got frozen. Because I, this is part of, part of the, the uh, uh, new logistics of events online. We have technical issues now as, as a part of the, of taking care of the events. Uh, Professor, are you back? Uh, your microphone is off. Your microphone is off. Thank you. I just I'm just looking whether there we go. Okay. Somehow I was thrown out. So uh, hopefully the, the COVID-19 uh, 
crisis is only temporary, that means we face a temporary impediment and both the CISG as well as the UNIDRA principles take care of thus uh, of such temporary impediments. The exemption only has effect for the period during which the impediment exists. Once uh, there is no longer an impediment, the, the factory is no longer shut down, then uh, the seller again is obliged to deliver the goods promised under the contract. What is not affected by, by the impediment is the right to avoid the contract, especially by the other party. The other party may avoid the contract <coughs> if uh, the non-performance uh, by, the, by the seller, for example, leads to a fundamental breach of contract. Uh, Let's have a brief look at the remedies for hardship. First of all, again, uh, contract clauses contain remedies for hardship and the new hardship clause under the new ICC hardship clause has several alternatives uh, from which the parties may choose whether they want a clause that they have a duty to renegotiate the contract or whether the court or tribunal may adapt the contract or terminate the contract. So the parties are free to provide for the remedies, likewise as in their contract clauses, they can provide for the threshold for hardship. Under the CISG, I said the CISG also covers hardship. Uh, for hardship, we have the same remedies as for force majeure under Article 79. CISG, that means that we have an exemption from the liability in damages and specific performance is excluded, but there are no other or different remedies between uh, force majeure and hardship under the CISG. This is different in the UNIDRA principles. There, the primary duty of the parties is to renegotiate the contract in case of hardship. And upon failure to reach an agreement, the court or tribunal may either terminate the contract or adapt the contract with a view to restoring its equilibrium. <coughs> Unfortunately, there is no time here to discuss whether these remedies are, in my view, appropriate or not. I think the, the CISG is enough also in this situation to lead to fair and reasonable results. <coughs> Thus, I come to my conclusion. Uh, COVID-19 can be a force majeure or a, hard, a hardship event. It's primarily up to the parties to provide for contractual clauses dealing with uh, situations of force majeure and hardship. The CISG and the UNITRA principles cover these situations. And in my view, they are more predictable and better suited than any domestic contract law that I know, and at least at the international level, there is no need to have any further legislation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Schwenzer, for your, for your uh, brilliant contribution. Um, we, will, we will leave the Q&A to the end of the session after, after everyone has spoken. So uh, I have a couple of questions, but I'll, I'll reserve them for, for later. Uh, uh, in the meantime, it's, it's my, my pleasure and my honor to introduce uh, my friend, Professor Edgardo Munoz. He's, he is a uh, professor of law at Universidad Panamericana in Guadalajara, Mexico. He's an arbitrator, counsel, legal expert in domestic international arbitral proceedings, uh, a, a, a authority on this on international law in his own right. Uh, professor Edgardo, the, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Daniel. Um, it's a great pleasure to, 
to be with you today. Uh, thanks to the uh, Brazilian branch for organizing this uh, beautiful event um, where we will be able to discuss different approaches that uh, different instrument countries take to this pandemic. Um, my presentation is titled Mexico will one of the last guardians of the Pact Sun Banda resist? And the question is, is fair. It's fair because uh, Mexico um, is one of these civil law countries that have at least at the level of business to business um, and uh, resist uh, business to business, national contracts, contracts resist to, uh, I don't know if call it the need or the temptation to uh, change their uh, impossibility uh, regulations, norms to make them more flexible. Uh, in, in few words, in Mexico, the Rebusic Estantibus Clause hasn't been implemented in our own law. So um, I'm going to. I'm going to start my presentation by uh, telling you a bit what happened and how where contract law is organized. Um, in, in Mexico, since middle of, of March, there were uh, some of the states, federated states already taking measures to tackle the COVID. But our federal government, Mexico is a federation as, as Brazil, our federal government did not issue uh, a decree until the 30 of of March. And this decree was titled Sanitary Emergencies for Reasons of Force Mayor. So the title is very revealing. Uh, and, and it was actually appropriate that they titled it Reasons of Force Mayor. Because in Mexico, there has been this distinction between act of God and force mayor events. Uh, if they would have used act of God or caso fortuito, caso fortuito, which is a term in Spanish, they would have given the focus on the pandemic itself. But by titling force mayor, they give more importance to the decree itself that actually listed the type of, authority, uh, of activity, activities, commercial activities, social activities that were permitted and also listed those who would not be permitted as from that time up until actually this week where we are uh, starting to, um, to reactivate the economy. So um, as Professor Spencer already introduced, this decree in Mexico caused that certain activities couldn't simply be performed. And some contract related to those activities could not simply be uh, yes, perform, while others became more difficult, even because the market of that, uh, of that specific contract disappeared or because the channels of distribution um, had certain difficulties in being implemented. So the focus of everyone in Mexico and, and elsewhere in the world um, was on the type of provisions that we have in Mexico to um, address this, this sort of, of impediments. And in Mexico, the things are a bit complicated because um, we follow the French tradition that still divides our applicable law to the contract in at least three different main bodies of, of rules or three different types of contracts. We have on the one hand, the B2B business-to-business -to -business contracts were burned by the Code of Commerce or where Code of Commerce is, is, is something that still has a lot of relevance because many countries has been, uh, have been governed for many years through that code. We have the civil code. Uh, actually, I correct myself. We have 34, 33 civil codes, each per, each per state that govern the uh, activities between consumer to consumer. So every state has its own civil code. And then we have the um, consumer protection law, which governs B2C business to consumer transactions. Uh, 
So I'm not gonna, um, I'm gonna focus on the B2B, which is the business to business. And uh, besides the fact that our commercial code is very uh, comprehensive, it doesn't deal with every, every aspect. So we have a federal civil code to supplement not only the code of commerce, but many other commercial or, or federal uh, laws that have been issued uh, over the times in Mexico. And neither the code of commerce nor the civil federal, co uh, federal code uh, in contemplate the possibility of hardship events. I mean, if an event becomes more onerous, that does not amount to impossibility. It doesn't amount to force mayor. It doesn't amount uh, to act of God. Simply the parties must perform the contract. And if they cannot do that, well, um, because it's indeed impossible, the breaching party will be released from the obligation to pay damages. It won't be forced to comply with the contract and the other party may eventually avoid the contract because it has lost any interest. But if the contract has simply become more onerous or more difficult to be performed, there is no remedies for that. It's a breach of contract, damages may be claimed by the um, creditor and therefore, um, um, yes, the obliger, the obligee must comply. Um, this, of course, um, is, may not be fair in many instances. And uh, because of the state of the law so far, what happened is that the government started through their commissions and secretaries started to um, reach some agreements. For example, there was an agreement with banks. The National um, Banking Commission agreed with the banks, main banks in Mexico, their interest would not be imposed or charged, no penalties on uh, failure to pay interest will uh, um, take place for the next four months. Um, we also have um, the um, Finances and Securities Commission negotiated and, and uh, Insurance Commission negotiated with the main insurance companies that they will cover any, any events or any uh, sickness uh, related to COVID and that they would not, they would not distribute uh, any profits among, among the shareholders so that they have uh, full pockets to address any eventuality that may occur during, during this time. Uh, and there were also other, other specific matters, for example, for uh, leases but this would be uh, C2C leases, not commercial leases. So for C2C leases, consumer to consumer leases, uh, there were some states that uh, enacted new laws suspending, suspending in some circumstances the obligation to pay the lease. Um, my presentation is titled in a way and with a question mark. And this is, this is for on the one hand, because not all the legal, the Mexican legal system, contract legal system is, um, is strict to follow all times the Pactus Unser Banda. Because as I said, uh, uh, several states have their own civil codes and for C2C matters, some states have already adopted, adopted uh, provisions on hardship. So, but these civil codes, which pertain to C2C matters, are not applicable to commercial contracts, which are perhaps the more important contracts for their amount of money involved. But besides that, Mexico is also um, a contracting state of the Vienna Convention on the sale of goods. And as Professor Spencer already uh, mentioned, Article 79 of that convention that applies to contracts that are governed by Mexican law and that have the character of an international sale will benefit um, of a different concept of uh, impediment, not of impossibility like the traditional Mexican law that it should be 
really impossible to perform. But um, in a way, to a new, to a proper interpretation of 79 uh, CAG that uh, would allow, in some instances, to release a party from the obligations to pay damages in case that in case the circumstances, the economic circumstances, change to an extent that has almost become impossible to perform. Uh, but if we are dealing with pure Mexican law, which is the case in some contracts, uh, there would be no much possibility to change the basic uh, obligations uh, that the parties negotiated from the outset. However, this may be changed soon. I, uh, there have been some signals uh, in the, in, from the government uh, in an attempt to make or incorporate some hardships, hardship, uh, situation, uh, hardship provisions to deal with this situation. And the will to do that is actually related to arbitration and big contracts. Uh, as many of you know, Mexico at the beginning of last year, uh, um, 2019, got involved in at least in, a, in, 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 in around 10 arbitrations uh, under the rules of the LCIA, the ICC, where Mexico is suing uh, foreign companies that agreed to build, install, deliver, and also provide some of the natural gas that Mexico buys from North America. Uh, the argument that Mexico raised is that two arguments that the contracts were unfair and that the circumstances have changed. Those contracts are governed by Mexican law and uh, Mexico is the seat of arbitration. So for the own government of Mexico, it would be very difficult to convince an arbitral tribunal that Mexican's provision should be uh, read differently that, uh, that they have been read through all the years, um, at least the hardship provisions on Mexican uh, national law. And the other, uh, this, this arbitration by, these arbitrations, by the way, they have been uh, suspended, temporarily suspended. Because the government wants to, uh, or is willing now to renegotiate those, those arbitration that uh, are for uh, thousands of millions of dollars. And the other signal that I see that may lead Mexico to incorporate hardship in their provisions, in commercial law provisions, is that during the pandemic, during the COVID, Mexico has refused Pemex, Pemex, which you know is, is the Mexican uh, petroleum company, National Petroleum Company. In the news, it has been reported that Mexico Pemex has refused to take delivery of several cargos of uh, gasoline, invoking partial force mayor, partial force mayor. I don't know what law governs those contracts, but I, uh, at least in Mexico, there is no such a partial force mayor that Mexico is now invoking because of a uh, Crack down of the market for gasoline. As I don't know if that happens in Brazil, but in Mexico, the price of gasoline is now very low. I mean, people is not using their cars. So um, I would conclude with that. In Mexico, the um, clausula rebus estantibus which does not exist for purely national B2B business to business contracts. We have the possibility to invoke the CSG Article 79 for those uh, sales governed by the CSG, uh, usage or application of the UNIDRA principles, as um, uh, Madam Ingeborg Schwenze already said, would allow some of the parties to rely also on hardship provisions. And for C2C contract, some states, some Mexican federated states have provisions on hardship and uh, they would be able to invoke as soon as the courts open, <laughs> because they are closed so far. So another of these things that happen, I mean, the law is there, but we cannot uh, apply that. 
Hello. So thank you very much uh, for your attention. It's been a pleasure to be with you. And uh, I remain available for every any question you may have. Thank you, Edgardo. Once again, the questions will be presented at the end so that we can have a, a discussion and Q&A with everyone involved. Uh, in the meantime, it's my honor to, to invite Professor Rodrigo Momberg uh, to discuss ad adaptation and re renegotiation of contracts in, in Latin America. Professor Momberg is Professor of Private Law of the Catholic University of Valparaíso in Chile. He's counsel and legal expert in commercial arbitral and commercial proceedings. Professor uh, Rodrigo, the, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. First of all, uh, well, good morning, everyone. And uh, I want to thank uh, uh, Dr. Pereira for the kind invitation to participate in this uh, seminar with uh, such uh, excellent speakers, really. So I'm going to share my, uh, yeah. I think I'm sharing now the, uh, the screen of my computer, if you can tell me. Yes. Okay, excellent. Good. Um, so, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm going to say some, some general ideas, really, because the, the time is, is limited, of course, and uh, about uh, adaptation and renegotiation of contracts in, in Latin America. Adaptation and renegotiation is always uh, linked to hypotheses of uh, hardship or change of circumstances, or as we call it in Spanish, uh, imprevision. And uh, this is an important, I, I don't have to say it, important subject in this, uh, in these times. So uh, just give me a moment. Uh, yeah, there, there's better. Um, as uh, Professor Chuenser said, um, uh, all this uh, uh, emergency of this pandemic, uh, it has uh, uh, just uh, such a severe effect, uh, economic and social uh, disruption. So um, I will focus in some uh, Latin American uh, jurisdictions uh, but of course, just in a general general overview, I don't I don't have the time, and I, I don't want to be arrogant to know to say that I'm an expert on all of that uh, all of those uh, jurisdictions. But I can say some things about it, and then I'm going to to make some final conclusions about the necessity or not, and the state of the art about uh, uh, the revision of contracts in case of uh, extraordinary circumstances like uh, we are living now. So let's uh, start as, um, as a matter of uh, historical observation, Latin American civil codes of the 19th century and really those enacted on the first uh, half of the 20th century, following their European sources, uh, did it include any a general provision on change of uh, circumstances. But the severe economic circumstances and social changes of the 20th century, as well as the influence of uh, modern civil codes and the reception of new legal theories, such as the socialization of private law, solidarity in contract law, led to the inclusion of rules on change of circumstances in the reform or the enactment of uh, uh, Latin American civil and commercial codes during the uh, or after the second part of the 20th uh, century. So uh, I, I have made a, a classification of, uh, of uh, uh, Latin American jurisdictions. Of course, they are not all included here just a bunch of Latin American uh, jurisdictions between receptive and unreceptive uh, legal systems in, in this matter, based on the readiness or not of the specific legal system to recognize situations of change of circumstances as being legally uh, relevant, and therefore granting the possibility to the affected party to rely on a system of uh, remedies in, in that case. So, um, for instance, we find as receptive legal system, Argentina, Bolivia, Brazil, Colombia, Guatemala, Paraguay, Peru, uh, 
and uh, as unreceptive, unreceptive uh, legal system, Chile, Mexico, uh, this is based on Edgardo, <laughs> Edgardo's uh, presentation, Uruguay and uh, Venezuela. As I said, this is not a complete uh, panorama, but it's just an example of uh, some, maybe of uh, some of the most important uh, uh, jurisdictions in, in Latin America. So I will say uh, now some things about uh, some of these receptive or unreceptive uh, legal system. Let's, let's see first uh, in the case of uh, Argentina. Um, in this uh, uh, original version, the, the former Argentinian civil code, the civil code of uh, Bell Starfield, strongly supported the principles of uh, freedom of contract and pacta sunt servanda. And the imprevision theory uh, was incorporated only uh, in the year uh, 1968 by Article 1198. Um, since then, Argentinian legal theory and case law have developed, I would say, a consistent and, and relevant doctrine uh, with regard to the subject of uh, unexpected uh, circumstances. And um, uh, this is, has, has been widely analyzed in theory, and I think uh, most importantly, have been tested in practice especially in periods of uh, economic crisis, which have uh, affected Argentina since uh, 1975. And because of that, it's not a surprise that the commercial and civil code of 2015 includes expressly uh, imprevision on its article uh, 1091. So uh, according to that provision, it is uh, in provision, it's applicable in the case of a commutative contract for deferred or continuous performance. Um, in the case of uh, the performance of uh, one of the obligations or the obligations of one of the parties has become excessively onerous because of extraordinary, uh, an extraordinary alteration of the circumstances. All of these linked to supervening and uh, external causes. And um, if uh, it is not a risk assumed by the affected party. One uh, kind of uh, oddly, I would say, uh, uh, feature of this uh, new provision is that uh, unforeseeability uh, is not uh, mentioned in the provision. Um, because uh, uh, unforeseeability is a traditional and common condition for the operation of uh, hardship or imprevision. And um, there is a discussion, as far as I know, in Argentinian legal doctrine on the necessity or not uh, that this uh, supervening and uh, external and extraordinary circumstance is um, should be also unforeseeable for the affected party. But uh, for me, it's a kind of uh, weird that a provision on unforeseen circumstances does not uh, mention really uh, that, the, that the, the, this event or circumstance uh, is, should be unforeseeable. With regard to the remedies, uh, the affected party may uh, have the right to request the partial or total termination of the of the contract or the uh, adaptation of the contract in all cases by by the judge if we go to uh, another jurisdiction and i'm just going to say a couple of words about it because uh, I, I know that uh, there are people here <laughs> that knows uh, more than me on, on brazilian law so um, the, the civil code of 2002 also uh, includes uh, um, the regulation of uh, excessive onerosity under the title of termination by uh, excessive onerosity. Again, in the case or applicable to contract uh, for continuous or deferred performance. And um, 
uh, with the requirement that uh, this extraordinary and unforeseeable event makes excessively onerous the performance uh, of one of the parties, but with one, I think, very interesting uh, addition that this excessive onerosity also uh, must imply an extreme advantage uh, to the other party. So in a way is uh, a restriction for the uh, applicability of uh, these provisions. Not only excessive onerosity, but also an extreme advantage to uh, the other party. Uh, with regard to the remedies uh, available for the affected party, the affected party, uh, again, uh, can request uh, the termination of the contract, but at least not in the text of the provision. I'm not sure what happened in, in judicial uh, practice, but, uh, but uh, he's, uh, he, has, he does not have the right to request uh, adaptation uh, of the contract. A revision of the contract by a judge or an arbitrator, just the uh, termination following the uh, codice civile, that is uh, with the same, uh, the same remedy, and the advantage uh, party may propose an uh, equitable modification uh, of the contract if he wants to avoid the uh, termination. What happened in uh, Colombia? There is no provision on the civil code. Uh, uh, civil, the Colombian civil code is uh, largely based on the Chilean civil code, the, the Andres Bello civil code. But uh, there is a limited recognition of imprevision based uh, in another uh, general, I would say, principles of, of law uh, by the case law. But it is expressly recognized uh, by the Commercial Code of 1971, Article 868, which uh, allows the revision of the contract by extraordinary circumstances. In, again, in contract of uh, for su successive periodic or deferred performance, in the case of extraordinary unforeseen or unforeseeable circumstances, which makes uh, excessively onerous the performance of one party. The remedy available is a uh, request uh, for the affected party, the revision of the contract by the judge, which if possible is allowed, uh, he, the, the judge can make equitable adjustments to the contract. That for me at least sounds a little bit dangerous. If this equitable adjustment is not uh, possible, the judge um, may decide uh, or decree the termination of the contract. And finally, with regard with this uh, receptive uh, legal system, we have uh, uh, Peru also with an express uh, recognition of uh, the excessive onerosity of the obligation in uh, its uh, civil code of 1984. <clears throat> this is more or less similar to what we have been uh, talking about, about the, in, in, with regard to the, to the conditions of application, commutative contracts for continuous periodic or deferred performance, also exceptionally applicable in the, uh, to other contracts. I'm not going to, to, to stop here. Uh, again, in case of excessive, uh, excessive onerosity because of extraordinary and unforeseeable events. With regard to the remedies, it is uh, interesting that um, the, um, the code uh, provides for the uh, adaptation of the contract by the judge in order to remove the excessive onerosity. I think this is, I like this, this uh, statement of the, of the Peruvian civil code because it does not make any reference to subjective or I would say liquid uh, concepts like uh, equity or fairness. It's 
so adaptation has to be directed to uh, remove the excessive onerosity of the contract. What happened to unreceptive uh, legal systems? We have here, for instance, Uruguay, no provision in the civil code regarding change of uh, circumstances or imprevision, but and um, uh, but also also not no but but also the case law uh, in Uruguay has rejected the application of imprevision or hardship in cases of uh, excessive uh, onerosity. Um, what happened in Chile? We have no provision in our civil code, uh, Andres Bello's uh, civil code. In fact, the code uh, have a strong recognition of uh, the pacta sunt servanda principle based on uh, Article 1134 of the French uh, Civil Code. It's our Article 1545. Contracts lawfully entered into are a law for the contracted parties and cannot be invalidated except by mutual consent or for causes, causes uh, authorized by law. Legal doctrine, especially contemporary legal doctrine, I think is in favor of the admission of uh, a restricted uh, and limited admission of uh, imprevision uh, in, uh, in some um, exceptional cases based on other provision of the code, Article 1546, which uh, provides for the principle of good faith in the performance of contracts. But our case law, especially the Supreme Court case law, has uh, consistently rejected the uh, application of uh, hardship or imprevision uh, with regard to uh, uh, contracts, uh, especially private law. So uh, in its uh, last uh, decision uh, regarding the subject, uh, uh, was very clear about the um, rejection of this uh, theory. The court said something like, neither Article 1446 nor Article 1460, which provides for the interpretation of the contract on the basis of the party's intention, are legal grounds to invoke imprevision because neither the duty of good faith nor the intention of the parties are contravened if the creditor claims the performance of the contract as agreed. So uh, we have some, uh, just a couple really, and, and literally just a couple of uh, decisions of uh, lower courts, some uh, one or two uh, of uh, courts of appeals and uh, another of, uh, of courts of uh, first uh, instance. Um, uh, that uh, admits imprevision, but I, I, ha I have to say that our Supreme Court has not yet issued a decision uh, applicating uh, with the admission of the, of the uh, imprevision theory, and on the contrary, it has rejected its application. If we go to arbitral decision, then the situation uh, change a little bit, but not too much. I mean, there is a limited acceptance of uh, imprevision. And, um, but again, just like uh, uh, extraordinary and exceptional uh, remedy. And the problem is that there is a lack uni of uniformity in these uh, arbitral decisions with regard to the conditions or requirements for imprevision to be applied. And especially with regard to the remedies. Uh, available for the parties because some decisions uh, decided uh, for the termination of the agreement with no room for adaptation and other decisions have uh, revised the contract and adapted to the new circumstances. So the, 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 the panorama is not uh, really uh, settled yet in this, uh, in this matter. As a conclusion, I think that in Latin America, it is a clear trend towards the acceptance of imprevision. I should say that any new reform 
of uh, substantive reform of a civil code in Latin America or the enactment of a new civil code will uh, include a provision on imprevision. But uh, there is no yet, I think, a clear agreement on which is the system of remedies for uh, imprevision. Uh, especially uh, if we if we revise again the provisions that I that I show you, um, there is no mention, for instance, to renegotiation of contract as a as a first uh, available remedy for the parties. That I think is the best uh, the best option. So maybe a good um, model is uh, this provision uh, that is included in the in the principles of Latin American contract law, an academic uh, endeavor uh, published in 2017, which uh, follows uh, more or less closely the uh, the model of uh, the unidra principles that uh, uh, Professor uh, Schwenzer uh, showed us uh, in the first uh, presentation. But I think can be can be a good a good model. If we need some kind of special legislation for these uh, extraordinary times, uh, the, these times of uh, COVID or pandemia, um, I think that is not a, a, a really an, an easy an easy question, and it's really a difficult answer. Uh, uh, Maybe we need it, but if we do it, uh, we have to, uh, in any case, it should be always of exceptional application, uh, of a temporary nature, just for a limited period of time, and ideally uh, for a specific economic uh, sectors. I'm not, um, I don't agree with a general provision. Uh, a drafting of a general provision in these uh, times because we need enough uh, thinking about it, enough uh, reflection, and we need to have a good, a good. Uh, uh, we cannot introduce, for instance, a provision, a new provision in our civil codes based on what is happening uh, now. Uh, maybe some sector-specific uh, provisions or emergency. Uh, legislation is fine, but not a general a general legislation. Pandemia, the pandemia is clearly an extraordinary and um, unforeseeable event. But the question is, uh, we hope we have to make uh, we have to bear in mind if this extraordinary and unforeseeable event makes the obligation the performance of the obligation of the contract impossible or uh, excessively onerous. Because if that is not the case, the contract has to be complied. Just application of the general principle, pacta sum servanda. So thank you very much. And um, yeah, I, I, will, I will be happy to answer any question uh, after the, the last presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Rodrigo. Uh, speaking of uh, coming up with laws uh, to deal with the pandemic, Brazil has been uh, very active in that field. At least there are a lot of legislative proposals. And since we're speaking about Brazil now, um, that, that let's segue into Professor Renata Steiner's presentation on force majeure and possibility in Brazil. Professor Renata Steiner, as we know, is a, a private law professor at the Universidade de Presbiteriana Mackenzie. She's also an arbitrator and counsel in commercial arbitration arbitra proceedings. Uh, and she will be uh, discussing uh, Brazilian law and how Brazilian law deals with this situation. So, Professor Steiner, uh, you, know, you have the floor. Thank you, Daniel. Well, good morning, good afternoon to you all. I would like to start thanking the CSR for the kind invitation. It's a huge pleasure to be able to share some thoughts on Brazilian law with you, and also an honor to hear Professor Schwenzer, Professor Munoz, and Professor Mondo. So, thank you very much. Well, in my presentation, I will address some general remarks on how this Brazilian uh, civil code deal with some of the problems of the contractual problems caused by the coronavirus pandemic. I'm not, of course, um, I'm, I won't be able to provide you a full panorama, so I've chosen to speak about some specific issues. And uh, my focus will be commercial contracts, so um, I'm not focusing on consumers' contracts. 
Well, uh, to do that, at first, I'd like to point out a fact that has already been uh, pointed out by the previous presentation, is that uh, it goes without saying that many that this pandemic will, or uh, as a matter of fact, has already impacted many of the contracts in course. Not all of them will be impacted, not all, but in amongst them, those impacted, they will not, of course, be impacted in the same intensity. Uh, but it doesn't matter, I think, in the world you're listening to us from, you understand exactly what kind of problems or legal problems this pandemic may cause to uh, a country. So the problems are kind of universal. Professor Genta has already uh, pointed out some of the problems. I'd like to point out uh, some uh, other problems that uh, in the legal perspective will be caused or are ongoing uh, to the contracts. For instance, temporary obstacles to perform or to receive performance increase in cost of performance, decrease in value of the performance, and increase or decrease in costs associated with the performance. So uh, that being said, we have um, uh, a universal problem that has to be solved either by the parties who can agree to a solution previously in the contract, for instance, in a hardship clause, or an enforcement jar clause, or in a review clause in a contract, or after this pandemic occurs by renegotiating the contracts. But in case parties are not able to find a solution, then we have to look at uh, the legal system that governs or the, the domestic law or the international conventions such, such as the TISG or a Lex Mercatoria rule, such as the UNIFDRA principle that governs the contract. So although we have an universal problem, we have a local solution to that specific contract. And that goes that that leads us to the question: How does Brazilian law? That's my um, that's what I want to talk about. That's my 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 subject matter. Uh, how does Brazilian law deal with this um, problems that I've just raised? I've chosen to speak about two um, figures, namely the impossibility of performance and force majeure. But in order to make clear why I chose to speak of those two, and considering the previous presentations that have uh, talked about that, spoken about hardship. I will also uh, briefly talk about uh, hardship, although it's not actually uh, what I intended to, to, to do. So um, Brazilian law, we find rules of impossibility, force majeure, and also change of circumstances that I'm calling here at hardship, just to make it easier, though there is a, a controversy if that's actually a hardship clause. But uh, to start with impossibility in Brazilian civil code, and I'm talking about impossibility that happens after the conclusion of the contract. There are three main rules that, um, that rules impossibility in Brazil. The first one, it's found in Article uh, 234 that deals with the loss of the object. The second one is uh, Article 248 that deals with impossibility in intuito personae to do obligations. And uh, finally, Article 250 that deals with the impossibility in not to do obligations. So we have these three rules, and I'm not going to, of course, uh, read it to you, but trust me, they don't define what it's to be understood, uh, what, what's impossibility in, in Brazil. So there is uh, no legal definition of impossibility in Brazilian law. One could argue, well, but that goes without saying. We know what's impossible perform, what, what's impossibility to perform. I would um, honestly disagree to that. If we think, for instance, that uh, there are different definitions of impossibility in different domestic law, and I would just make a, a brief um, brief mention to the German Civil Code, for instance, that in the reform from 2002 has added in paragraph 275. Uh, the economical impossibility that was recognized by case law but wasn't actually recognized by UBGB, meaning that we can understand impossibility in different ways. Of course, there is this natural impossibility that goes, for example, the, the object has been destroyed by a fire, but uh, we have to actually think that this kind of real and factual impossibility is normally uh, normally does not happen. We normally have other kinds of impossibility that are not the natural ones. So despite of the legal definition, Brazilian scholars uh, could find one, but I have to be honest and say to you that there is no 
um, study in Brazil that it's really that really focus on the impossibility to perform. So usually the impossibility is found uh, just in um, in textbooks for uh, law of obligations and in a very brief uh, brief pages. So it's it's not really a topic that has been uh, studied in Brazil. Brazilian scholars would agree that uh, the definition of impossibility in those articles I've just mentioned is uh, that impossibility that's absolute, uh, meaning that uh, it's very, it's actually impossible to perform, not only more difficult to perform objective that uh, affects not only the debtor, but also anyone, no one can perform. But, and the most important thing, I think, in my opinion nowadays, is that it's the impossibility it must be def definitive and not temporary. So uh, meaning that we have to have these three qualifications in order to apply those rules. And that, I repeat, does not uh, come from the Brazilian legislator, but from Brazilian scholars. And that's not, that's not actually a criticism. I'm just uh, pointing out what's the, the state of art of the impossibility in Brazil. Uh, however, the rule, it does not define impossibility, but it fixes the consequences applicable to the impossibility. And these consequences are two, and they depend on the existence of fault. So if there is no fault from that third, then we have a termination of the obligation ex legi ipsuyuri automatically, meaning that there is uh, simply the, the contract is terminated or the, that relevant obligation is terminated. However, if that third has acted with fault, then we have a uh, um, situation of breach of contract. And this situation of breach of contract will be ruled by other rules in Brazilian civil code that do not actually refer to impossibility, but it goes without saying that impossibility is one way of breaching the contract, like causing the impossibility is a way to breach uh, the contract. And some scholars would say that uh, in the breach of contract, for instance, the impossible per impossibility to perform can also be understood as the loss of interest of creditor. But that's not actually uh, our, our focus here. But as we're speaking of fault, uh, that leads us to the second figure I'd like to talk about, which is uh, the force majeure rule. We have a force majeure rule in Article 393 in Brazilian Civil Code, which is an uh, one extension of liability rule. Differently from the rules on impossibility, here the Brazilian legislator has provided a definition of what is to be understood under the term um, force majeure. Um, it also treats with the fortuitous event together with force majeure. Just to make it easier, I'm just referring to force majeure because it doesn't have really uh, a huge difference between of consequential uh, between these this two figures. Well, what's a, fa a force majeure? It's an event beyond the control of the parties whose effect can, uh, could not have been avoided nor prevented. It's actually, uh, I think it's also a universal definition of force majeure. However, uh, here we have a definition, but we don't have the full uh, legislation. Uh, the, the legislation does not address fully the consequences applicable to force majeure, because it just states that debtor is not liable for damages. But it does it does not say, for instance, what happens to the contract and what happens to the duty to perform. We know that the performance has not occurred due to a force majeure, but we don't know if debtor is still liable to perform and not. How, how long will he stay liable to perform and so uh, attached to that relevant uh, contract. And this is so because the force majeure rule is usually combined with another rule that uh, dictates the consequences applicable to the contract. I would say that the force majeure rule is not, at least I'm speaking of course of Brazilian, uh, Brazilian perspective, it's not a rule that stands alone. So we have to understand this rule always with another rule that will uh, address the consequences to the contract. One could argue then that the force majeure rule could be combined with the impossibility rules that I just uh, mentioned, and that's partially correct. Um, as long as a force majeure event occurs that also renders uh, the, um, 
the performance impossible in a definitive way, then we have the full panorama. We have the consequences very well established. We have termination and we have uh, the exempt of, uh, exempt, uh, exemption of liability to that term. However, if we think of, for instance, in temporary uh, impossibility that can happen due to a force majeure event, we won't find at least not in the way Brazilian scholars understand impossibility, we won't find uh, um, a solution to that, even if we combine this uh, two, two figures. Um, and uh, moreover, none of these figures combined, force majeure or impossibility, will provide solutions to some situations in which uh, there is no impossibility, but there is a difficulty in performing and this difficulty could in some time and sometimes render it almost impossible to uh, force the debtor to perform but that's not an impossibility in the way Brazilian scholars understands impossibility to apply the rules on impossibility um, meaning that we have a, a, a problem to be solved usually these kinds of problems where we have a difficulty of uh, the performance will be so would be solved by the hardship clause, and that's uh, why why I wanted to to say something about the rules on hardship in uh, Brazil. Uh, Rodrigo has already mentioned it. We have a very peculiar um, um, article on hardship in Brazil. So the article is four seven eight. It states that in long term contracts, it's long term contracts. Actually, what's very important is that the performance is not. Uh, at the same time as the execution of the contract. So it's not actually a long-term contract necessarily, but usually just to make it easier, I'm referring to it as such. So in a long-term contract, uh, they may be terminated if uh, performance becomes extremely onerous due to extraordinary and unforeseeable events. As long as there, are, there is also an extreme advantage to the other party. This last sentence that I've uh, highlighted, I did it just to show you that this is a peculiarity of Brazilian uh, law. Uh, one could understand that, well, it's to see if a, a performance is rendered extremely onerous, one has to look between the equilibrium between the performance and counterperformance. But that's not only what this article is about, it actually requires that the other party profits from this, um, this, this extremely onerosity. And that's actually a high standard that's not very easily fulfilled. Um, as I was preparing this, this presentation, I took a look at a recent commentary on this article from a preeminent scholar in Brazil, Professor Schreiber, and he said, and I thought it was very interesting because he was criticizing uh, some some scholars that say, well, we can we can simply disconsider this last sentence, and as long as there is extremely onerosity, we don't have to look at extreme advantage. Otherwise, it's going to be a too a high standard that will not be easily achieved. And then he said that, well, that's just has an inconvenient. And then he was he used this quotation mark to to to, to point out. The inconvenience of this is to simply uh, this considers what the legislator has chosen, and that's actually very uh, a very very bad uh, sign of interpretation here uh, in Article Four Seventy Eight. And um, moreover, just to mention, there is a project of a statute of law uh, that's not that's still ongoing in Brazilian Parliament that will perhaps, if it, if approved, will have a, a rule on on review of juridical uh, judicial review of contracts, uh, stating that there is no uh, extraordinary event, for instance, in inflation or currency variation. Um, this is not, it's not a, a definitive rule, it's just a temporary rule that would um, deal with the problems caused by the coronavirus pandemic. But if approved, then we have two problems in uh, 
relying on this article. The first one is that uh, as per its wording, it's really the high standards are hard to, to fulfill. The second one is that uh, the case law standards and this new case law, this new law also fixes a high standard of what is to be understood uh, uh, regarding the extraordinary and unforeseeable events. Um, and still, even if it were not the case, uh, we also have some problems in relying on this uh, hardship provision in Brazilian civil code, because there are many situations in which um, not the, it's not the performance that uh, itself that it's rendered more onerous, but other provisions. And this uh, this rule will, uh, refers to the, the to performance. Yeah, let's think, for instance, in take or pay obligations or bill to suit obligations, uh, when one has to pay even though has no chance of taking the the, the good or not having the chance of using that uh, building, to, for instance, in a lease uh, agreement. The point is, uh, the problems that I mentioned in the beginning of my presentation still uh, exist, and they do not fit any of the provisions of the Brazilian Civil Code that lead us to a legal problem. Do we have a legal gap in Brazil? I do believe we do have a legal gap. And to um, provide answers to this legal gap, one has to stretch the requirements or the scope of application of the available devices, of the available figures. And in order to do so, I would say that it's most likely that Brazilian scholars will go to the impossibility um, uh, rules than to the hardship rules. And that's actually for two reasons. The first reason I would say that, and it's a reason just based on the uh, on the status uh, from looking at the problems by now, that we don't have the time distancing to see how were contracts impacted by the coronavirus pandemic, meaning that there is no today, it's very hard for us to assess that there has been an excessive vulnerability and an extreme advantage to the other party. The second point is that differently from the rules on impossibility in force majeure, there are incomplete rules. The rule on hardship is a complete rule in Brazil, meaning that its scope of, scope of application is well defined, the definition is well, well done, and the consequence, namely determination of the contract, is also uh, ruled by Article 478. That leads to a problem to try trying to fulfill a legal gap by stretching too much a rule that it's very, very uh, complete. If we look at the impossibility or if we look at the force majeure rules in Brazil, we'll find that those rules are not very complete because there is no definition of impossibility and there's no definition of the consequences applicable to force majeure. I'm not stating that it's my personal, uh, um, that I would like to, to say that that's impossibility or that force majeure rules that better. I'm just saying that uh, from a methodological, methodological speaking, that's better to use this, uh, this known defined uh, concepts then you or, or, or the consequences that are not defined in the Brazilian civil code then try to simply disconsider the complete uh, the complete uh, provision that we have in hardship uh, clause. Well um, the point is that we live in certain uncertain times and law has to provide certainty here. Yeah, the best way to do it is, is, is to stick to a legal system and try to build solutions that do not collide with this system. So we have the tools in Brazil, but we are still in an ongoing process to build those uh, solutions. To end my presentation, and then I will uh, return to, to the first words I said, uh, that we have a universal problem vis-a-vis -a, -vis a specific solution or a local solution, not only local domestically, but I mean uh, uh, the, by the contract, by the law applicable to the contract. Uh, the last time I think uh, we had a problem comparable to this was after uh, World War, War II. And now we have a very advantage time to do that. We have an advantage. It's a bad, bad time. I don't think anyone is happy while we're leaving, of course, but we have an advantage. And the advantage is that we can now discuss 
we can have a dialogue and when we, we may rely in comparative law and in comparative solutions uh, to uh, deal with these problems. So even though the solutions are to be found in a domestic, for instance, if Brazilian law is a, the, the law applicable to that contract it has to be found here, we can actually discuss the same problems and understand how better these solutions can be provided within uh, Brazilian um, Brazilian law. And that's especially important in uh, international arbitration and international contracts, because then we can actually uh, have an impact not only in the material, material um, understanding of, uh, of the law, but also rethinking choice of law, uh, either by, or by, um, by arbitrators that can actually find uh, the better solutions to uh, that, are suit that is suitable for that specific contract. So those were my, my words. Thank you very much for, for, for your attention. Thank you very much, Renata. I think Ceza has returned. Uh, is Ceza here with us? Yes. So uh, uh, with that, we'll start the, the Q&A part of our, of our discussion. And I'll go ahead and, and uh, uh, Professor Schwenzer uh, said that she did not have time to address a couple of, a couple of questions of applicable, the, the application of the remedies of, of adaptation and renegotiation under the CISG. Uh, I would like to, to if, if at all possible, hear her opinion on this subject and uh, the commentary of anyone else on the panel who would like to, who would like to contribute. Uh, so, so uh, does the CISG uh, is adaptation and are adaptation and renegotiation remedies available under the CISG in case in the cases of hardship? Under in your opinion, well, I think they are not available under the CISG, and I think we do not need them. The remedies that we have under Article seventy nine that means exemption from liability and damages and exclusion of specific performance are enough. We do not need, if, if you have a remedy of, of renegotiation, I mean the parties, if they can, they will renegotiate. And uh, we cannot force them to renegotiate. So, so that's uh, regarding this remedy. And also adaptation. If the parties do not want to renegotiate, they do not want to adapt the contract. And why should a third party come in and adapt the contract? So this makes, and, and I think my colleague, Professor Momberg has, has shown it. He, he said, uh, well, it's, it's totally unclear how arbitral tribunals or courts will apply these provisions. So what comes out is unpredictability. Uh, not only whether a court or tribunal will adapt the contract, but what will the terms be of the contract. So I think, in, and also it will take much too long. Is, imagine if a court is to adapt the contract, then you have several instances uh, of court decisions. It might take six, seven years till you receive a final decision of the Supreme Court. Uh, with an adaptation of the contract. So that, that might not fit into this situation any longer. And then you have to, to enforce this, uh, this uh, court decision. Another maybe years to come till you can enforce it. So times have passed. So, and, and now you have an adaptation of the contract. It doesn't make sense. So uh, what is enough is that uh, the party affected by the impediment. And I think this crisis has very well shown that we should not distinguish anymore between impossibility, force majeure, hardship, imprevision. It's all, and I think there the CISG is perfectly suited to deal with all of that. It's an impediment beyond the control of the affected party. So that's the, uh, that is the, uh, the crucial question. Is it an impediment and not, is it impossible or almost impossible or only 
uh, very, very onerous. So, and I think the remedies that um, exemption from liability and exemption from specific performance, and then also it's not up to a court or tribunal to say the contract is terminated. No, it's up to the parties. And the other party uh, who is affected by the non-performance can avoid the contract. That's the normal system we have, avoidance by declaration of a party, and that presupposes, and I think that is very, very important, and it makes things, again, much more predictable. It presupposes that the non-delivery, for example, is a fundamental breach. And only if we have a fundamental breach, then avoidance is possible, and not without any further prerequisites a termination by a court or arbitral tribunal if they decide that it's proper in the circumstances. So I think the, the clear remedies by the CISG are enough. There are no other remedies that should be available. Uh, Daniel, if I, if I may just uh, sure. step in. Uh, sure. I, I, would, I, I would very much like to hear our other speakers about how this reasoning that Ingeborg made based on the CISG interplays with their with, with the various national uh, systems. Uh, should this uh, this uh, I, I idea that uh, all these different concepts uh, um, in, at the end of the day amount to an idea of impediment beyond the party's control, should that in a way uh, 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 um, interfere with the interpretation of the various uh, 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 domestic uh, systems, or uh, as, as uh, Renata uh, dealt with uh, Article 478 in Brazil, with the with its very specific requirements and effects, uh, does that change in light of this uh, of the um, magnitude of the problem that we are facing right now, and uh, or or it doesn't, and we we should um, stick to our uh, requirements under domestic law when the CISG is not applicable. Yeah, Any if I can speakers? say something. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I. Uh, uh, yeah. First, I agree with the uh, with the, what the Professor Chancellor has uh, had, uh, said. Maybe with one uh, uh, prevention that I I am fully aware that if the parties want to want to renegotiate, they're going to renegotiate. They don't need any kind of legal provision uh, saying that. Uh, I think, but maybe a legal provision encouraging the parties um, to renegotiate can be useful uh, to avoid, for instance, that a party just said, "I cannot comply with this contract." and I'm going to terminate it. If you ask to that party to show to the other that he is willing to renegotiate and then, then he can propose some um, voluntary adaptation of the contract can be a useful tool. In, so maybe it can function as an incentive for the affected party just not to terminate, to discard the contract, but to propose a uh, better solution uh, uh, if, if they want to work together uh, after this uh, disruption, of course, with the other, with the other party. And uh, about your, um, your question, uh, Cesar, uh, in the case of Chile, we have a 19th century uh, civil code. So the approach uh, with regard to force majeure uh, is very different from the CAG, of course. But I have to say that our, since I think in the last uh, 20 years, more or less, uh, Chilean legal doctrine uh, um, based on the CAG and based on the UNIDAR principles and, and other uh, international instruments are trying to make a reinterpretation of uh, our um, provisions of, of the civil code. And now I think we have agreement at the level of legal doctrine, I'm not sure about the case law. Uh, we, we are going to see it after <laughs> all this happened in the next uh, month, what, 
the, the, the in the next years really what what, what the, the the courts uh, are going to decide. But at the level of uh, legal doctrine, that the approach of Article 79 of the CFG is perfectly uh, applicable uh, to our uh, um, for an interpretation of our of our um, civil code provisions. So we agree I, I, as, an, uh, as a legal doctrine that it, it has to be an impediment that it is um, a, uh, that the party, the other party still have uh, available the other remedies like the termination or whatever, and that uh, it's not force majeure, it's not necessarily a um, cause of extinction of the obligation, but it's a case of non-performance really, uh, but of course without any fault, so you cannot claim damages or something like that. But it's a new interpretation based on this uh, CSG provisions and especially also the, the soft law international instruments of, of contract law. But we have to see what the courts are going to say about this, uh, this uh, legal doctrinal uh, interpretation. Okay, may I take the floor? Well, um, with regards to, uh, to Mexico, that would be also the case. I think that the provisions on force major, act of God, could be easily reinterpreted by our um, high tribunals, Supreme, tri Supreme, Supreme Court or appellate tribunals, to include uh, not only absolute impossibility, but also uh, impediments that uh, uh, can, couldn't be easily overcome or, or because of the excessive imbalance in the performance of obligations. I think that would be the best solution. By hearing to uh, the Brazil example, uh, I think, um, as, as Renata said, we need to look at comparative law because uh, what Brazil has done in terms of hardship may make even more difficult to claim hardship than on their force majeure or, or act of God, of God provisions. No, so maybe we should stay as we are. Uh, and that is possible. Uh, mm -hmm. this, I, uh, I understand that the CSG Advisory Council is, is working on an opinion on hardship. So uh, when it is translated into Spanish, it would be great to have a look at it uh, in Mexico to uh, provide some tools to understand how uh, Article 79 works for us in Mexico is part of our national law and how that could be used to reinterpret our provisions for B2B. And very fastly, I agree that uh, perhaps the best solution in terms of remedies for hardship is a uh, multi-tier negotiation, multi-tier dispute resolution clauses in arbitration. Professor Spencer focus on the time and the difficulties that a state court may have to uh, rebalance, adjust, modify, or terminate a contract. And we know that in arbitration, it could be faster, but still, uh, if that can be solved by, um, by the parties, it should be done by them. Uh, someone has uh, opposed the argument that arbitral tribunals can easily inter, uh, issue interim measures. But the interim measures that arbitral tribunals may grant in these situations involve actually deciding on the merits and, and very few arbitral tribunals will issue an interim measure or emergency measure telling the parties from now on you should to, you should perform a certain price, right? Or under certain conditions, it, it would be like deciding the merits from the outset. So, uh, uh, the bonds and guarantees that would need to be issued would be high. And, and so I think uh, negotiation as a remedy agreed by the parties may be the best solution. Thank you. May I? Of course. Uh, okay. Uh, well, I'll, I'll try to address both questions at the same, the same answer. So uh, Professor Schwenzer has pointed out that uh, for, if force majeure occurs in uh, CISG, then uh, the creditor, the other party, could um, resort to avoidance, right? And that's a problem in Brazil, because avoidance in Brazil, um, 
Jean, of course, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't bear talking about CISG in front of Professor Schwentz. <laughs> uh, yeah, the, the point is that in Brazil, avoidance is possible. It's a possible remedy in two situations. The first one is when the, um, the per performance is rendered impossible. Then we go back to those, those uh, articles that I just mentioned in my presentation. The second one is when due to the delay, the, uh, that the creditor um, interests in, the, in performance um, is lost. Well, these two provisions on avoidance in Brazil do not, do not fit actually uh, the appearance of a force majeure event that does not render it, it impossible to perform, so we don't have impossibility and we don't have termination. And second of all, as a force majeure exempts liability and also exempts the delay, there is no delay because there is no liability and I'm not, that's exactly what our civil code says, then we don't have uh, the possibility to avoid, to avoid a contract due to the loss of interest because there is no delay. So we have a legal gap in Brazil, uh, this legal gap will have to be to be found or will have to be built by the possible solutions. The possible solution is either a um, stretched impossibility and terminated contract, which is a little bit um, against the, the, the last resort of avoidance. Uh, and the second one would be to reveal the contract and that's giving uh, the arbitral tribunal or the, the tribunals a power that I don't know, I'm not sure if they have, as per the Brazilian uh, civil code. And the, the third possibility is to, for the parties to renegotiate. So maybe in Brazil, as long as we don't have answers to those questions and we have this legal gap, renegotiation will be the easiest way out of this uh, trouble we're in. But that's not something that we can build from legislate from a Brazilian uh, civil code. There is no duty to rene renegotiate. Some scholars, and I mentioned in my presentation, Professor Stein, but he has a book on it uh, on renegotiation, and he would say that re renegotiation has you or has as um, as far as the good faith principle, I think that's go, that goes too far away with good, with good faith. I don't think that's actually something that we can build from good faith. But um, that said, I think that it's most likely that the CISG remedies are more complete than in Brazil, the Brazil's remedy. So as Seven has asked, oh, what about if uh, to apply a domestic rule uh, where the CISG does not uh, rule that specific situation. I don't think that Brazil will be able to provide those answers because I think we have an incomplete panorama um, of that, uh, of this, the situations that we're facing. Well, I think this, this, this panel shows the wisdom of using uh, the CISG, for instance, uh, among these countries that have so, such different domestic systems and and uh, there'd probably uh, be a, a very large cultural clash between an America a uh, Brazilian party and a Mexican party looking at the same at the same problem under under hardship as per uh, Edgardo and Hanatha but let me make a provocation uh, to to Professor Schwenzer and to everyone else on the panel uh, uh, truly how bad is unpredictability in unpredictable times? When, uh, uh, Professor Wayne Seimer has, has a position on uh, the duty of commerciality of international arbitrators. He, his position is that because international arbitrators are guardians of the international uh, commercial order, uh, within the confines of the applicable law, the arbitrator should strive to apply the most commercially, commercially reasonable solution that the law would give to that problem. So uh, yes, that will that will uh, create a problem of unpredictability. But what is actually better uh, in these unpredictable times? Having a predictable but commercially disastrous answer to a problem, or to having a, a answer that is a little bit less predictable but much uh, more commercially viable? Well, what is your what is your feeling? Uh, what is the panel's feeling on on, on this provocation? Well, the, the question is, what is commercially viable? 
And in an international arbitration, we will have th normally three arbitrators from three different countries, from three different cultures. And they all will have a different perception of what is commercially viable. So I think indeed, uh, I would uh, value much higher predictability for both parties than to rely on, on domestic conception because arbitrators, although acting internationally, they come from a certain legal system. So they will have their own notions about commercial sensible solutions, uh, which will be influenced by their domestic legal systems and, and not by the, by the law that is applicable to the case. So I still stick to predictability then to some vague notions of uh, commercial viability. Anyone else? Uh, yeah, I just want to say, I, I agree with the uh, Professor Schoenzer and, and I would say that I think predictability is uh, the best uh, commercial solution. <laughs> There's no position between predictability and, and, and the best commercial solution. It, predictability is the best commercial solution. So yeah, <laughs> that's my answer. <laughs> Perfect. Um, there is a question made by Victoria Zanotto Farina in, in the YouTube. Uh, feed. Uh, she asked, "Can the inclusion of the of a uh, can the inclusion of an input term to a sales contract be regarded as the assumption of risk of the, of the impose of the events imposed by COVID nineteen?" May I ask? Um, uh, may I respond to that one? Of course. Okay. Um, yes. Um, agreeing on an input term distributes the risks uh, on the merchandise on the goods. Uh, during the period of performance, during the period of delivery. So um, usually if, um, let's take a, a, a clear example, if you agree on FOB and you are, um, you are unable to, um, FOB delivery is when you put the merchandise on board. If as the seller, you are unable to put the merchandise on board because, um, they were destroyed before getting to the chip. Well, that is your uh, your risk, and you have to uh, perform the contract unless unless there is force major with regard to the goods, or there is an impediment. If the if the goods were to be a, a painting of Picasso, a specific painting, you cannot perform again. So you would be exonerated, even if. Even if you agree on, on that in term, if the painting was destroyed before you comply with your obligation of delivery. But if, uh, if, if the goods were generic, you will need to try it again until you, until you do it. Because uh, with generic goods, you can overcome generally the impediment. So you try it again, unless it becomes excessively onerous and then you need hardship provisions, right? Uh, or, or, or to distinguish between how difficult it would be to overcome the impediment. In terms of enforceability, there may be many issues we, don't, we didn't talk about, but the pandemic was already in Italy um, hitting hard when in Mexico, uh, the federal government was still shaking hands. You see what I mean? So uh, uh, it's, it's a nice analysis of, of all these uh, risk allocation as well. Uh, and, and requirements for impossibility or impediments in general. That would be my answer. Anyone uh, else? I, Go ahead. No, no, I was just going to ask another question. Uh, so if, uh, would, you, would anybody else like to comment on what Edgardo just said? Uh, I was curious here about one issue. Uh, uh, we see uh, that uh, in many cases, maybe in most cases, uh, contracts are not affected by the pandemic itself, but are, are affected by acts of states in reaction to the pandemic, acts that may be proportional and uh, necessary, that may be exaggerated at, at points. So there is a, a, a whole discussion about uh, how far should states go in that regard, but, uh, the, uh, but, but, but assuming those acts are proportional and they're needed, 
and they they are taken in the public interest of preventing the spread of a disease that affects everyone. Does that make a difference in terms of uh, of the application of these concepts that uh, affect uh, contractual obligations? Because uh, just to uh, for, for, uh, uh, to give you an example, in certain situations, one party may be, and Ingeborg mentioned several of those cases, uh, may be uh, prevented from uh, you, uh, 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 performing its uh, usual activities in order to benefit from the contract as it uh, intended to originally, or be may be affected by 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 other um, state measures, uh, not for any other reason uh, than to uh, benefit the let's say society as a whole in terms of prevention of the uh, spread of the disease. Uh, how, how does that uh, affect uh, these uh, concepts of, uh, of, of, of impossibility or force majeure or act of God or anything else or impediments in general? Uh, given this very specific um, nature of the impediments, uh, not one that happens uh, for, for uh, by, by accident, but one that is taken by states uh, in the interest of basically everyone, including the party that benefits from uh, not being affected contractually by the, with the, those acts. Does that make a difference or is it the same thing we've been, we've been talking so far? In other words, not the, not the act of God itself, but the factum principis caused by the act of God. The effects of the factum principis caused by the act of God rather than the act of God itself. Well, may I start? Yeah, so in Brazil, I, would have, I, don't, I don't think that makes a, a difference because the concept of impossibility, that the three qualifications, so absolute, objective and definitive. Um, it also englobes the, what we call uh, the legal impossibility, which is the case. So it's not only the natural impossibility, but also legal impossibility that is uh, complied with the concept of impossibility. The problem of this kind of regulation says that is that it's a temporary regulation. So it's not an impossibility at all because it's not definitely. And then we have a problem of uh, how to deal with this concept in Brazilian civil law. Uh, but uh, the concept of natural impossibility or legal impossibility does not make a difference. So we don't have to rely to the impossibility. We don't have to rely on the force majeure uh, event. And to force majeure does not always lead to impossibility. That's the what I intended to, intended to say. Most likely, a force majeure event will render it impossible to perform, and most likely, I mean, an impossible performance will be due to a force majeure event. But it's not really necessarily to have the, uh, this this combination together. And uh, the example you gave is just one of, of, of some of the examples where we have an impossibility, but we don't have a force majeure event. I don't know if I... May oh, I? Uh, yeah, yeah. yes, yes. May I add something for the international level? Uh, well, usually we, we ask ourselves if there is an act of government making performance impossible or more onerous we ask ourselves whether this act of government is within the sphere of the risk of the party that is affected. So that would mean uh, if government uh, closes down the, the factory of the, the seller, that in principle, how we interpreted Article 79 up to now would be within the sphere of risk, more or less, of the seller. But I think we cannot apply this principle in these days because um, manufacturers around the world have been affected in the same way. And there has been uh, a, a lockdown in, in most of the countries uh, now. Uh, so I think uh, we should we should 
as you said, in, in Brazilian law, we should also at the international level at that time uh, equate the act of government closing down uh, the, the factory of a manufacturer or prohibiting export to a certain country uh, with, the, with the factual impossibility to produce, so, so where the factory has burned down or something like that. Yeah, I just, uh, may I? Um, just briefly, um, in, with regard to Chilean law, really the, the nature of the event, uh, uh, of course, it has to be external and out of the uh, sphere of risk assumed by the party and unforeseeable, but if it is a natural event or a human event, uh, doesn't make any, any difference. The importance is um, related with the effect of the event on the performance of the obligation. So if it is the effect is to make uh, impossible to perform the obligation, that will be force majeure or whatever. And if it is not uh, impossible, then we speak of another uh, kind of uh, issue, maybe hardship or change of circumstances. If if uh, it is uh, admissible, I, I, I don't think, I'm not sure about it, but uh, uh, the nature of the event is not uh, relevant. Uh, uh, is the effect of that event on the performance of the obligation what makes it force majeure or not, really? And if, if I may add um, uh, the, the question uh, of Cesar Trigger, Trigger, um, a consultation I, I had some days ago um, regarding the um, the requirements to to raise the exemption of force mayor. As you know, you can allocate risk. You can modify the definition of force mayor. Uh, you can uh, um, subject it to to requirements from the under the vast majority of countries. And there was these two enterprises, construction enterprises in, in one of the states in the north of Mexico. Um, one of them, uh, the creditor was uh, compelling by several notices to perform its obligations. And um, the contractor said, I cannot do it. I cannot do it uh, because the government has issued this uh, emergency decree. And the other party said, well, uh, even if that constitutes a force mayor under our contract, you should have give notice within 10 days of the force mayor event and set a time for performance later, a period of time where you have to perform that obligation. Uh, and, and there are several several contracts with that with those clauses at least around here. Uh, and and without giving a, a you know a decide in this case of giving an opinion, I think most of these requirements, when the force mayor comes from an act of government, became superfluous or at least uh, should not be should not prevent one party from relying on force mayor first because these events are widely known. I mean, what not is us supposedly the uh, the owner of the worst wanted if it was all around the the news the the uh, the origin of those of that force mayor and in terms of the period uh, of of grace to perform it was impossible to know when the government would lift the um the restrictions so uh, just as an example of how requirements uh, with contractual requirements may be also reinterpreted or affected depending on the origin of the impossibility. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we, are, we are actually approaching the end of our, our uh, allocated time here. And uh, before I turn to uh, Daniel uh, to ask you a final question, I just wanted to make a quick comment. Uh, this video uh, is going to be available at the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators Brazil branch website and, and uh, uh, on our uh, YouTube um, channel as well. Uh, so uh, uh, probably by tomorrow, it will be the whole thing, the whole two hours of discussions will be available there if uh, anybody wants to, 
uh, watch it again, or if anybody has, any of your friends have uh, missed it, uh, be sure to tell them that it's going to be available there. Uh, so, uh, Daniel, uh, I, I, I turn to you now to for the closing thank you, procedure. Thank, thank you, Cesar. Before before uh, closing the, the presentation, I'd like to uh, uh, give the floor to each of the presenters for for any closing remarks or in a minute or so. Uh, Professor Schwenzer, if you would like to say something to to sum up the uh, your, the whole your, your whole position on this, and then everyone else in the order of the presentation. Yeah, I started in my uh, my presentation when I came to the conclusion. I mentioned that I'm convinced that any international solutions are much better than any domestic solutions. And for me, uh, our presentations have clearly proven this statement. So I would urge any any persons who are uh, in charge of drafting contracts, not international contracts, not to opt out from the CISG and opt into some unpredictable domestic law. Thank you. Uh, uh, Edgardo? Uh, I think I will join uh, Professor Ingeborg Spencer in, in her last comment. Uh, uh, for many reasons, international instruments are, are, are better equipped and designed. So um, that would be that would be for me the same. Thank you. Professor Monberg. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I also agree with uh, Professor Spencer. Not only the CSD, but also all this uh, really uh, international corpus of uh, contract law, which uh, we can uh, refer like the Unidura principles, uh, especially with a lot of uh, legal doctrine and each day with more um, references by the uh, case law uh, to, to, to the Unidura principles and the CAC. So it's a very good option to choose a kind of contemporary international contract law uh, beyond our national uh, borders. So yeah, that will be my closing remarks. Thank you very much for the invitation again. Thank you. Professor Steiner. Yeah, well, uh, I have to agree with Professor Schwenzer, but as a Brazilian attorney, I have to, to also say that I look forward for us in Brazil to build some solutions that are um, very fair to the situation. So, uh, and there are a lot of countries in Brazil that are ruled by Brazilian law. And we, as you know, we have a um, very light discussion about uh, the possibility of choosing the, the law that will govern the contracts in Brazil. So meaning that many of the contracts in Brazil are gonna be, unfortunately or not, are gonna be ruled by Brazilian law. And I hope that we can uh, dialogue with the with international conventions and the CISG scholars that are very, uh, that have been successful uh, in, in, in so many years of CISG to build good solutions in order to find some solutions to our, our domestic law as well. Yeah, and then that's exactly uh, the last remark I would make is that uh, we have the possibility now when, when our legal systems are not sufficiently well, well prepared to deal with, with these situations to look at how uh, it is done elsewhere. And, and, and try to maybe incorporate either at, at the supranational level like the CISG instruments, but also looking to our neighbors and see how our neighbors deal with, with similar situations. So we, I'd like to thank the, the Charter Institute of Arbitrators for, for the kind invitation to be a moderator, uh, uh, just among, among the giants that are, are, are presenting their, their, their positions today. Uh, it is uh, a truly an honor and uh, I, I I think this was a great event where we had the opportunity to look at, at, at how the, the systems of, of Latin America and the CISG and uh, the Union Draw Principles deal with, with uh, the unpredictable times that we are living right now. So uh, I hope everyone had a great event. Uh, please, uh, if, you're, if, you're, uh, if you're in Brazil and you work with arbitration, uh, get in contact with Cesar Pereira to learn more about the, Char the Charter Institute. He has been doing, doing a brilliant job as our chair uh, for, for the inaugural uh, 
term of the Brazilian branch. And uh, for everyone else who has stayed with us up, up until now, thank you very much for your patience and thank you very, very much for your friends. Everyone, uh, Professor Schwenzer, Professor uh, Edgardo, uh, Professor Momberg, uh, Professor Steiner, says uh, thank you very much and y'all have a great day. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much.